Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. We are live and recording from 191 South Main Street in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Thank you so much for joining us on this evening's adventure into the past, as well as into technology. As I mentioned, we are we have a live audience here, and we have our webinar friends, and I'm just so excited that we can share this history more broadly than what this room can hold. This evening, you will hear, you will meet two individuals who work tirelessly to explore and promote education through history. Their efforts enrich the lives of students in our area, and the entire Harrisonburg Rockingham community benefits. I certainly benefit from their expertise and enthusiasm and am grateful for their contributions to Rocktown History's mission. Bo Dickinson is the Social Studies Coordinator for Rockingham County Public Schools. He has been instrumental in developing statewide opportunities for local history curricula. Last year, Rockingham County fifth grade students spent the year studying our local history. Bo also shepherded Dale McAllister's biography of Lucy Francis Sims, and he has been a very supportive trustee for the Historical Society. In a moment, Bo will introduce you to our featured speaker, Carol Nash. Full disclosure, this is our hybrid event. Fortunately, our sponsors of Peel Production are in the room to handle the technical logistics. The recording will be added to the Rocktown History YouTube channel at some point. You will receive an email tomorrow with a reminder and my contact for any further questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you. Our audience here will be able to ask questions, which we'll ask Carol to repeat for our webinar guests. And we ask our webinar guests to please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. I will be monitoring comments and questions but they will remain anonymous to the general audience. So for anyone who has just joined us, I say welcome. And I will turn this mic over to Bo Dickinson. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, good evening, everyone. This is an exciting place to be. Uh, I think with that local history curriculum that we've had, we can add a chapter of it here. Uh, in our local history curriculum, we kind of have a thematic curriculum for our fifth grade students. So they get little chapters and slices of the place that they call home. That's the idea is that you make history relevant by looking in your own backyard. And uh, we have a chapter on Spotswood's Crossing of the Blue Ridge Mountains which allows us to understand the geography of the Shenandoah Valley. We have a chapter on the burning during the Civil War. We have a chapter on Elder John Klein. We look at the history of the Northeast neighborhood through the life and experiences of uh, Lucy F. Sims and the community of Zenda that she taught her first year in. We talk about the founding of Shenandoah National Park and some of the hard history associated with that, with some of our East End students actually having uh, parents and grandparents and great-grandparents who once lived on that mountain and called it home. And uh, of course, I think we're going to have to add a chapter about archaeology and the actual foundation of Harrisonburg City or what evolves and becomes Harrisonburg City. So good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Bo Dickinson. I am the Social Studies Supervisor. I'm honored to call uh, myself the chair this year of the Rocktown History Board. Unfortunately, this is my sixth year, and that's the end of my second term, so I'm going to be leaving the board here in December. But I love that we're able to have an event here at this place. As Penny described through your visit, it is quite complicated, the journey that brought us here into this building. Uh, it, recognizing the foundation, or the founding of Harrisonburg, and perhaps the complicated history that's associated with it, but our sincere desire to tell that story fully. And we've certainly peeled back the layers and discovered more stories and more people, and we hope that that's the future of this place. As you know, Rocktown History is the home of the Harrisonburg Rockingham Historical Society, located in Dayton, Virginia, with a museum, archive, genealogical library, and one of the best little bookstores in the entire Shenandoah Valley. 
We are broadcasting this evening for those uh, folks that are joining us virtually. We are in the historic Yellow Button. That building is located at the corner of South Main and Bruce Streets. Some Valley residents will likely recall the 20-foot number two pencil that once advertised the stationery store that we are now gathered in during the mid-20th century. If you turn to my right, you will quite literally walk back in time to what was believed to be the symbolic location of Harrisonburg's founding. From the yellow button of the 20th century, we pass through the remains of the Hall House that was constructed during the 19th century. And then beyond the back wall, there is a small 18th century home that for generations has been called the Harrison House. It has that characteristic bluestone exterior that led some to call the village that grew up around it as Rocktown. As much as this is a literal journey through time and space, the story of this old house is also an exercise in history and how we learn about the past. While it can be initially uncomfortable to have some stories change, it is very exciting to think about how we can still deepen our understanding of the past through science and technology and discover new chapters of our history. I think this further enhances the value and the importance of these stone walls and how they symbolize the earliest days of this place that we call home. We are thrilled to have the archaeologist who led the team that made this discovery, Dr. Carol Nash of James Madison University. Please join me in welcoming here this evening to tell us more. Good evening, all. Um, I do want to say, first of all, that I am humbled this evening because I know there are many of you in this room who care deeply about okay. Let's see. Ah, there it is. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for your forbearance. Um, so I find it fascinating, ironic, that when we began this project, it had been given the name History Revealed and Restored. And we really were not prepared for the revelation uh, that came with the project, but uh, more on that in a bit. Uh, just to get ourselves oriented, we are in the heart of downtown Harrisonburg, Virginia, and not far off of Court Square, uh, really, close to the, uh, con really close to the intersection of Main Street and Bruce Street, for those of you who know our city. Um, this is the building. This is the building that historically is known as the Thomas Harrison House, and um, you'll notice that the front door is fronting on Bruce Street, and that is an important point. We're going to come back to that in just a bit, but it is a rubble house, and it certainly looks like it had seen better days, for sure. It has been through a lot, but most importantly, it's still here. It's still standing, and that means a great deal. And so when the archaeologists, myself and my students, were hired to answer some questions that I'll list in just a few moments, there were many other people who were involved. This is definitely an interdisciplinary uh, effort as well as uh, policy decisions, all sorts of things that made this a very interesting project. Fraser Associates, Kathy Fraser and Tom Clayton have been involved with design. They are architects, historic architects, and they uh, worked really hard with us to help us understand and to make some plans. Uh, Ed Chapel, who has passed since this uh, re work was done, uh, just an incredible architectural historian at uh, Colonial Williamsburg. Many people don't know this, but he is the person who wrote the book on the stone houses of the Page Valley. Uh, very important. Mike Worthington uh, did some tree ring dating for us that got us into all kinds of trouble. There's me and then Susan Buck. Uh, Ed Chapel's wife, who is a chemist and a specialist in paint analysis. So we all came together to work on this project. When we were hired, the city and the Margaret Grattan Weaver Foundation, the Historical Society and Rocktown History and Asbury Methodist Church had all come together to make some decisions about the future of the Thomas Harrison House. And we were hired as archaeologists to 
confirm once and for all that this house is as old as everyone says it is. Uh, and that would be about 1750. Um, there were also questions about how the house had changed over time. Uh, that question about why there was this strange opening on Bruce Street that doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, we also, of course, as archaeologists, also bring in history and we were asked to do what we could to find out what the Harrisons were up to here and the households that were established after the Harrisons were gone. Um, one of the really interesting questions that we was, was posed to us was this question of how has this land changed since the Harrisons were here, since this house was built? In other words, how has Black's Run shaped this landscape? And that was a really good one. Um, but also, of course, that goes hand in hand with this question of flood impacts. No, no question about that. And also, just to gain an understanding of the cellar. So why the cellar? I'm often asked why of all the places we could have dug, we went in the cellar. Well, it's very simple. There was a dirt floor in the cellar where there is asphalt in the parking lot. So I think that says it all, but <laughs> being facetious, you learn a lot from cellars. But uh, of course, many of you came down this evening to actually tour the cellar. Um, we're adventurous enough to make it down these steps, but the cellar is interesting because of some of the features that are historically known about this. And first of all is this cooking hearth that for all intents and purposes has this uh, association with English architecture, uh, with English cellars. So that has always been of great interest to people, but also that German spring, the fact that the house was built over top of a spring and that the spring is still there, that you can still see these things today. Um, so what does it mean that you have a house in early Harrisonburg that has this mixture of cultural traditions in the architecture? And that's one of the things that we know is very, very classic with the valley. Uh, starting in the colonial period, you have this interesting mix of architectural styles. Um, but we had to do some background research to really get into this because there were questions about the Harrisons. And when you're doing archaeology, it's neat to look at the artifacts, it's cool to find things, but ultimately we want to tell stories about people. That's what this is all about, is telling stories about people. So just doing some background research, the Harrison story actually starts in Long Island. And uh, the patriarch Isaiah, who is Thomas's father, uh, immigrated from far western England, almost on the border with Wales. He was a younger son of a family, uh, probably didn't have much chance of owning land where he was from. His probably went to his older brother with primogeniture, but uh, he came to the United States or to North America at this point in time. He comes, shows up in New York, the colony of New York, um, and in 1688, and he's a blacksmith. He's a young man, but he's a blacksmith, but he comes with money. That's the interesting thing. He came with money because within a year of being here, um, he had gotten already, he had purchased 100 acres of land, and he was 19 years old. And he did not come as an indenture. So what that tells us is what, that's what it means when it says he is a freehold. So the family shows up, he shows up there. He married almost immediately. <laughs> it's like things were happening fast for this guy. Um, he and his wife had five children. She died. He married again the next year, uh, had more children. And she actually came from a well-to-do family, so they, he got more land, and uh, they had more children. And so the, to recap, after being in America for 20 years, he'd had two marriages, 10 children, extensive land holdings, and um, he was in his early 40s. So not too shabby as far as that goes. They moved to Delaware, where land was cheaper, where he, could, he sold his land in New York, made money, and that's the story of the Harrison family. It really is the story that stays with them um, throughout the generations. They definitely were buying land and they were selling land pretty regularly. But they sold their land in New York, moved to Lewes, uh, Delaware. And um, what I find really fascinating about this, they bought a 907-acre plantation near Lewis, um, but then he deeded a lot, that land to the sons. And so basically what he did was he divided up the property and he gave each of his sons 250 acres and allowed them to sell that and then go do what they wanted to. And it's just that it's an interesting story of how they end up in the valley. We don't have time to tell it tonight, but they did end up here. Isaiah comes along, he's 70 years old, he's traveling with them. 
They show up, they're identified, the sons when they sold the land in Delaware are identified as yeomen, meaning they were farmers basically. Um, they sold the land between 1737-1740 and uh, came down here. And I just recently have learned, for those of you who love maps, which I do, um, what I have circled there, of course, is the Harrisonburg area, but that really is Mole Hill. This is Thomas Jefferson's map, yeah, this is the Jefferson Fry map, and uh, Peter Jefferson's map, excuse me, uh, and that really is Mole Hill. But you can see that there's nobody settled there, <laughs> and so there's the hill. Um, so what we know from the records is that by the early 1740s, uh, the, the, um, Harrison's sister and four brothers were in the Central Valley, and they were patenting land with their families. So they were leveraging the land their father gave them to buy land down here. And um, I think recently, uh, I know the Historical Society and Dale McAllister has really been interested in this. Melrose Caverns, for those of you who love Melrose Caverns like I do, um, that was the seat of one of the Harrison sons. And so there are actually more archeological sites on that property than any other uh, Harrison associated uh, property that we know of in the valley. But anyway, there they are. Um, so Thomas, we get to him. He was always identified as a farmer. Um, he married twice and had nine children. <laughs> and, uh, by, and his uh, second wife was Sarah Cravens. And the sons who, you see the son and the daughter who are, are listed on the slide, they all moved to the valley. Every one of them came to the valley um, and they all died here except for two who then left uh, and went to Kentucky and Illinois. So they intended to set up shop here. It's very clear. Uh, and of course, the time that during which they did this was the French and Indian War. So this was a time period when people were leaving Western Virginia. They were going back across the Blue Ridge to the east. And what we um, don't often think about is the fact that that opened up a lot of land that previously had been under patent. People just abandoned their early patents. So it's, they were very clever about these sorts of things, the Harrisons. So Thomas, between 1744 and 1773, patented over 2,000 acres. And he didn't own all of the land within that triangle, but that's the extent of his holdings, essentially, um, all the way up to Linville, uh, down to, um, um, on Muddy Creek, on Linville Creek, on Cook's Creek. So those were, uh, those were his places. So the question is, where did he establish his homestead? Now, I have to say, as an archaeologist, I was pretty suspicious that this would have been the first house he built. This over here would have been the first house he built. Because usually, with early colonial settlers, they live in log cabins for quite a while before they will actually put the effort into building a stone house, which is quite a, an undertaking. So was it in Harrisonburg? Did he build a stone house in the 1750s? That's what everyone believed to be the case. So this is where things get pretty interesting, though. The state of Virginia gets involved. Of course, 1778, Rockingham County splits uh, off, and it is recognized um, as, um, uh, splits off of Augusta. It's recognized. And then 1779, Thomas Harrison sets aside two and a half acres of land close to the courthouse, around the courthouse, and um, that, well, what we now recognize as Court Square, essentially. And within just a few years, he and his sons, actually within two years, next year, he and his sons added another 50 acres. And they went to the state, they went to the state of Virginia and said, we need a county seat. We've got a new county, we want the county seat to be here in Harrisonburg. But this is where I learned something I was not aware of until recently. Um, I looked at the actual, the act of the assembly that established this, the town of Harrisonburg. And um, the thing that always confused me about Harrisonburg is that there were no trustees. If you look at the early history of towns in the Shenandoah Valley, they all had trustees. There's no trustee for Harrisonburg. And it was because Thomas Harrison had already set aside the land. They were not going to have to wrangle over where things were going to be built. The land had already been set aside. Thomas Jefferson was the governor of the state of Virginia at this time. Um, but here's what the, here's what the um, Act of the Assembly says. Um, it would be a great advantage to the inhabitants of the county if established a town for the reception of traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. And so be it therefore enacted that the said 50 acres of land so laid off shall be 
the same hereby established a town by the name of Harrisonburg, the freeholders and inhabitants of the said town, as soon as they have built upon and saved their lots, according to the deeds of their conveyance, shall then be entitled to the name of the county seat. So there's a caveat. It's not just let's set up the town. Let's go ahead and give you the, um, we're going to establish Harrisonburg as the county seat. It was, we'll establish Harrisonburg as the county seat, but you got to build. You've got, and of course, the, the state of Virginia wanted taxes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's what they, they wanted taxes, they wanted protection. This is from the um, archives at Rocktown History, and I have to say, between those archives and between the courthouse, uh, the clerk of court here, Chaz Haywood, who is here and has done so much to preserve records, the, the way that we can do historical research now is so different and is just amazing. But here is a um, drawing that was in the archives there that sort of shows what those lots would have looked like. And uh, you'll notice I have highlighted number seven because that is where the stone house is located. Um, there's definitely a Methodist connection here. There's, that's part of the story. Thomas was an Anglican. He is recognized in the court records of Augusta County as a tax collector for the parish. Um, but his sons, some of his sons and daughter, uh, embraced Methodism. And um, those of you who were downstairs with me heard me tell you the story that with Methodism came the requirement of emancipation of enslaved people. And uh, we've been able to look through some of the wills, and we'll tell more about that story in just a moment. But I do want to give a shout out to Nancy Hodges and that new book on the history of Asbury United Methodist Church, uh, because she's done a tremendous, uh, made a tremendous contribution in telling us that history. Uh, but of course, there is the story of Francis Asbury. There is the bronze plaque that is on the, uh, the stone house. And, um, the, the possibility that church may have been held in the stone house, one of the first uh, services for the Methodist church. I believe that is true, but for a different reason other than Thomas Harrison was living there. Um, so 1785, Thomas Harrison died. His property was willed to two sons. One of those sons died in 1790, and we know that Reuben, by this time Reuben, was getting into the business of selling these lots big time. And so, what he did, we've got some evidence that he had built something there and that he had rented it as an inn. In 1816, Maria Carr, the, uh, that wonderful Recollections of Rocktown uh, that was written, she talks about the fact that there was a stone house with two rooms on each floor and a basement. Under the house was a beautiful spring, the house occupied by Colonel James Hall. He, a few years after, built the house now occupied by General Roller. This was, would have been the roller house. That's the hall house right there. Now, looking at it from the street, this would have been the I house that was the roller house and then the uh, hall house behind it. Um, the thing that I find really fascinating about this is there was a lawsuit before the Virginia Supreme Court uh, as late as, what was that, 1872, where they were still arguing over who exactly owned the Thomas Harrison House, what we call the Thomas Harrison House. Uh, it had to do with uh, the Hall family, the Effingers, the Harrisons, and the Rollers. They were all before the Supreme Court of Virginia. But the question is, who was this Colonel James Hall? Maria Carr says that he was living in the stone house while he was building the, the, what became the brick house, of course. So he looked him up in the census, and there were eight people in his household, three white males, one white female, three enslaved males, and one enslaved female. We're going to come back to that story in just a moment. It's, very, it's, it's an unusual story if you just look at this, or the numbers are unusual if you just look at them without knowing more of the context of what was happening in this particular area. More on that in just a moment, but don't forget uh, Colonel Hall. Um, but just to talk a little bit now about what we know historically, how the house and the lot uh, evolved. This is the 1832 Crozet map of uh, Harrisonburg. And by the 1820s, lots seven and eight had been sold to the uh, Hall family and they had constructed uh, the Hall house. The stone house, of course, was still standing, but we don't think they were living in it anymore. This is probably the greatest find, I think, of the whole project. Um, this was published in 1898, but it was from a sketchbook, a Union soldier who came through the valley uh, in 1864, and 
uh, his name was Taylor, and he drew a picture of the Thomas, what we now know as the Thomas Harrison House. And you see that it's fronting on Main Street. It's pointing toward Main Street. It's a small house. It's a small stone house, but you can pretty much make out the, um, you can make out the measurements. You sort of get the feel for the, the size. You can see the cellar windows and everything else. And so this is what we think it looked like right, when it was built until it was changed to what we know it uh, as today. Um, and so when you went through the house and Penny was showing you around, there's a lot of discussion as to what exactly the house is. It seems to be a mix mixture of architectural style, um, but it's always been something of a mystery because it, isn't, it doesn't really fall in line with some of the more traditional architectural plans. So very much a homemade vernacular house, very much. Um, if you follow this through the maps, what you'll notice is the lot absolutely grows as the house grows. You'll see the houses that are, you'll see that the Thomas Harrison house or the stone house is separated from the hall house and the roller house. And this is 1877. By the time we get to 1885, things have really started changing on these lots and they've been divided up more. There are businesses that are established. And then 1911 to 1913, this is what it looked like. The stone that you see in the front is from Asbury, when Asbury was being constructed. Um, yeah, so that's what you see there. But you'll notice that there is quite a, a large um, barn, not really a barn, but quite a large carriage house, stable, um, so forth. There is a spring, what looks like a spring house, and then you get over into the stone house. So that's what it looked like in 1911. First photographs we actually have of it. If we go to the insurance records, what we begin to see is this block filling in. There's just no question that the houses are beginning to grow and the businesses are growing. Um, Times Dispatch, oh my goodness, 1928, um, had a, a newspaper article about a visit to the oldest house in Harrisonburg where spring bubbles out of the room. And the woman who was writing these, uh, she had a column in the Richmond Times Dispatch. Her name was Betty. Uh, and they kind of set it up for her to, to get a sense, but the, the old millstone uh, antique shop was here in the roller house. And so, the, well, the roller house, of course, has been taken down, but that was here, and that was the antique store. Um, this is 1936 when the WPA came through and documented uh, the houses of the, the older houses of the valley. You can see that um, it had seen better days, but what I find fascinating is the way it's connected to the houses next door. Uh, this was 1950. And then it was placed on the National Register in 1973. And what's really fascinating is, of course, it's significant for local history, religion, and architecture. And the date of construction was identified as 1750. So once you get that on a National Register nomination, it's hard to convince people otherwise. So here's where the archaeology comes in. Um, you know, so it has been sanctified as 1750. We start excavating and we are expecting that we're going to find artifacts that go back to that time period. And so the, uh, a lot of folks worked on this project, but particularly members of the Massanutten chapter of the Archaeological Society of Virginia volunteered hours on this project, both in the lab and in the field, and made a huge difference. And that's one of the things we always try to get across with these archaeology projects, is there is always room um, for volunteers. So the, one of our predictions, of course, is that the cellar was going to have layers of flood deposit. And what you're seeing there is the FEMA map that shows the floodplains. And here we are sitting in the 500-year floodplain, exactly what we would have expected. And you look at the flood history of Black's Run, and there is all kinds of evidence of floods that would have come down through this area, probably ended up in the cellar. And as we showed you downstairs, when you were going through the house, it's very clear that what was the land surface at one time was much lower than the land surface today. So it has been built up over time, not only by the parking lots that have been built, but also by all of the flood deposits uh, from Black's Run. So we were not surprised to see that. And then as we were, uh, we were looking at the architectural features in the cellar, we could very clearly see that when the house was built, the um, surface of the street was much lower, the level of the street was much lower, and they actually had to add more steps to get out of the basement as that uh, lot began to accrete over time. So 
Flooding has been an issue here, but probably not when the house was first built. This is something that appears to have been more of a late 19th century, early 20th century problem. But as we were excavating, we did find seven layers of flood deposit. So the floor definitely had evidence of that, no question. Um, and then after we finished, this was July 18th, right after we had finished, there was four inches of rain and there were two feet of water <laughs> in the basement. And so um, you all saw the soil that was on top of the black plastic, so it's kind of a mess. So we were definitely dealing with that. Okay, this is what it looked like when we started. Uh, the basement had a um, furnace in it. It had pretty much been left alone for a very long time. There had been a lot of things stored down there, uh, but we actually had to do a lot of cleaning. We did even vacuuming. We vacuumed the soil, so to speak, and that's what it looked like when we finally got ready to start our work. So we had to clean a lot out. We took several truckloads of uh, trash out of here. Um, so we were pretty excited to be able to just get to it after that cleaning had taken place. And we excavated in four areas. We excavated inside the hearth. We'll show you pictures of that. We excavated beside the hearth. We excavated where, uh, in an area where we thought there would have been a wall separating the cooking area from the spring. And we also excavated close to the um, east wall of the house, looking for the original door. So that's where we were working. So when did the entrance change? We're gonna get into our questions. When did the entrance change from the east facing to south facing? We think we've got some evidence of this. We excavated right below this, what looks like a cut in the stone that doesn't look natural. And what we found was a demolition level and artifacts that date to about 1890 or so, 1900, which would tell us that there had been a major change in that wall at that time period. And here is just a drawing of that that sort of gives you the sense of what we were talking about there, all of that rubble that was just thrown in and the artifacts very, very late uh, right there. If you look at the um, insurance maps, there's something really interesting that starts to happen. So in 1886, the first insurance maps of uh, Harrisonburg, the Hall House and the Thomas Harrison House are not connected. But you get into 1891 and they are connected. And that's when the door changed. That's when they connected the two houses finally. That's when the door shifted from facing this way to facing that way. And so by the time you get to 1897 and from then on, the houses are shown as connected. So we were able to answer the question of when that shift occurred. Um, somewhere between 1886 and 1890, well, anyway, 1891 is when that change occurred. So there was that. Was there a divider between the hearth and the spring? Indeed, there was. We actually found evidence of the old uh, wall in the joist above, and then as we were excavating, we were able to find, whoops, let me go back for just a second. We were able to see that there was very clearly uh, the shadow of a wall in the floor. So that basement was actually divided up into work areas, the cellar was. Um, the spring we did not do much to because we were very afraid of its condition. We didn't want to um, disturb it any further. It definitely needs work, but as we were doing our excavations, we found that it has filled in with sediment and that there were actually five steps that went down into the spring at one time. So it was much deeper uh, and again, pretty remarkable to see that here. So in the future, perhaps there will be work done on the spring. We hope so. Um, again, what we showed you downstairs, the early, if not original, cellar door with the hand wrought straps and with the heart finishes. Beautiful, beautiful piece uh, with very large boards. So we're happy that that is, has been preserved. And those are, yeah, those are, there they are. Yep. Nice work. Beautiful hand wrought work. So what about the hearth? We love to excavate into hearths because they not only have all kinds of really cool stuff in terms of cooking implements, you will find all kinds of broken plates and crocks and spoons and forks that are diagnostic that will help you date the layers you're excavating in. But you also find evidence of what people were eating when you dig into a hearth. And so the stones that you see piled up are ones that we removed as we were excavating into the hearth through layers of ash. And as we started working there, we began to realize that this was really quite an extensive feature. It was quite large. And we did find that there was some depth to it. 
There were some really interesting artifacts, but by and large, we weren't exactly seeing what we thought we were going to see. We were not finding a lot of ceramics or a lot of animal bone. What we were learning was that, as we learned all throughout this project, the basement was built on uh, boulders of limestone, as so much is done around here in Harrisonburg. You know, you can't dig too far down the, uh, into the basement floor and you're on bedrock. And so we found that the hearth had actually been constructed on top of a huge boulder, uh, which didn't really surprise us, but there it was. So the question was, where's all the food? Where's, <laughs> where are all the artifacts and the food? So we excavated to the side of the hearth, and this is where we found many, many artifacts. We found what is called a feature. It was a pit that had been filled in with darker soil, and it was in this feature, what we, we named it Feature 17-1, 2017. It was our first feature uh, that we found. Uh, it was a pit, and as you get, can see in this photograph, 56% of the ceramics from our work came from this trench that we excavated right next to the chimney itself. And so this is the place where the dumping had occurred. We found ceramics, we found bone, we found glass, you name it, it was there. Uh, this is what really helped us date these layers and help us answer some of the questions that we were asking about when the house was built. And this is just a, a plan map that shows you the size of the feature relative to the unit that we were working in and all the stones that were there, but it just gives you a sense. You can imagine a pit that had been dug and filled in with trash, and that's exactly what that was. Um, these are the artifacts that we were finding in that trench and in that pit. The earliest diagnostic artifacts, meaning ones that we can identify from a very specific time period, were manufactured between 1790 and 1810. We saw nothing that took us back to 1750. Nothing that took us back to 1740, 1750. Uh, you can see the ceramic types that are shown in this image. And when you actually average the dates of their manufacture, which are pretty well documented, we came up with about 1810. And that 1810 is not 1750 <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so we had over three, we had almost 400 ceramic artifacts from that unit. And uh, what we were able to see is that there was good stratigraphy. We were happy that there, that, that was there. But only 1% of these artifacts were dating after 1870, and 94% of them were between 1790 and 1840. And that did not really jibe well with the story of this house being built in 1850. So what are we going to do with that information? Um, we noted that there were few matches in the tablewares, that there were lots of pieces that were from a uh, plate over here, a different kind of plate here, a different bowl here. And that is often taken as an indication of assemblages that are associated with enslaved individuals because they are given the leftovers. They're given, after the dishes break, they're given whatever is left. And so when you look through their pantries or you look through what is remaining uh, in their houses, it's often these individual pieces and nothing matches. And that's pretty typical. Uh, that has been found at many, many, in many, many places where these excavations have occurred, and we absolutely saw it uh, here. And this was one of the first indicators that, we, that told us we actually had evidence of an enslaved family in the house. So the earliest, you can see again, these are very utilitarian, a lot of utilitarian wares that we excavated, kind of the heavy duty cooking uh, pots and things that you would expect to see. Uh, in terms of the glass, the glass was much later, uh, early to mid 19th century, but a lot of clear glass that was 19th and 20th century. The nails that we found post 1800, again, nothing pointing us to 1750. Um, and then you have these small finds, these buttons that are made out of bone. You have glass buttons, but we have pins and a lot of notions from sewing, a lot of repair work being done on clothing in that basement. Whatever, whatever is going on down there, somebody is doing a lot. It's, there's a seamstress uh, down there working in that basement. Um, we did find a copper or brass strainer that was in the pit that we were telling you about next to the, um, next to the um, chimney and where the hearth was located. And this would be a pretty typical thing that you would see uh, associated with cooking. 
Um, but we also found a huge quantity of animal bone, and these are animal bones that were just basically bashed. Um, these are not fine cuts of meat. They're, we're talking sides of beef that were processed in that basement. Um, and a lot of pig, a lot of cow, deer. There were some fish scales, interestingly enough, a good bit of chicken and turkey. But the um, archaeologist who analyzed the bone, Dr. Elizabeth Moore, who is now our state archaeologist, looked at this assemblage and she said, this is not an assemblage from a household. This doesn't make sense. There's a lot more bone showing up here than one would expect if they were cooking only for a household. There was some major cooking going on, some major processing going on in that basement. And so that was sort of taking us, where, you know, you can see where things were not quite fitting together with the artifacts. So Susan, Bell, Susan Buck, who is a chemist and a conservator, was brought in. She, Frazier and Associates, uh, got her to come to Harrisonburg, and she was able to sample paints uh, within, in the house itself, not a, none of the lime wash, of course, down in the basement, but uh, she sampled areas on the exterior and, act well, no, actually, she did get some of the lime wash in the cellar, uh, but she did a lot of sampling in the interior. And one of the things that was really interesting about her work was the chemistry of the paints. It's very, apparently, very, very distinctive to particular time periods when pigments were available. And so what she found <coughs> is that the window was originally painted red-brown. So if you can imagine the house as a, uh, having these red-brown, red ochre, red lead, win uh, lead windows, but, but that wouldn't have been available, that would have been available mid-18th century. But then the stone walls had been painted deep yellow. The house had been painted deep yellow outside at one time with red window sills. Okay? Um, and then there was a dull pink. They were hitting all the high points, okay? Um, but again, look at the dates. They just don't match up. And so she, in the interior, the plaster, she took a good look at the plaster and the wallpaper post-1830. Um, then the tree ring dating, and we don't need to go into the great details, but let me just tell you that, as you know, trees will grow a ring each year. But more than that, they are very sensitive indicators of precipitation so that they form patterns. And if you cut down a tree and you look at the tree rings in the stump, you'll notice that the rings are not uniformly separated from each other. Some are very thin and some are very wide. You can actually, if you're lucky enough to work in a place where trees are, where you have old enough trees, you can core into trees, pull out the core, and read the rings and have the signature, not only for the age of the tree, but the climate during which that tree, the, the precipitation. And so what has happened is dendrochronologists, tree ring dating folks, have created these beautiful sequences of um, tree rings all up and down the Shenandoah Valley, over into eastern Virginia. And uh, you know the, the story is, ultimately, they end up with these sequences that will go back in time. And um, Mick Worthington from the Oxford Dating Labs has a sequence that goes back in the Shenandoah Valley to about AD 1500. And so what he did, he shows up, and he is looking for the, uh, the pieces of wood in the house, the joists, for example, or the rafters, that still have their sap wood on them that will still have go all the way to the interior to the core of the tree so that he can really tell how old that tree is by matching the fingerprint of that particular tree with against his master list that he has created okay so when he did that do, 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 um, he went he got a number of these from the basement uh, joist downstairs and uh, seven were cored four retained complete sap wood, so he felt pretty good about the sample, and what he found is that those trees had not been cut before 1789 or the spring of 1790. The felling dates suggest the house was constructed in the spring of 1790 or shortly uh, thereafter, several years after the death of Thomas Harrison in 1785. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> All right, so the overall findings, archaeology, paint analysis, dendrochronology, the house is late 18th century, early 19th century, not 1750. Um, 
And then Thomas Harrison could not have constructed the house because he had been dead four or five years before the trees were even felled for construction. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, so this is where we go into a very different kind of um, discussion, and that is where did that story come from in the first place? Why did people believe that the house was that old, and why did they want to associate it with uh, Thomas Harrison? And um, John Wayland had a lot to do with that. Uh, John Wayland was a prolific historian, you know, 40, 50 books that he published in his lifetime. He was one of the original faculty members uh, at what is now James Madison University. But there are some questions about the way that he put some things together. And this is one of those instances where he was writing history at a time when there was this push to valorize the past, to create this history of Western Virginia in particular, so that there were heroes, so that there was this heroic tale of how the valley had been settled. And of course, it was very much a white story. It was a story of men uh, and so forth. But he got excited because in um, 19, um, I think this is 1903, there had been published an account of um, Moravian missionaries who had come through Harrisonburg, who'd come through the valley, and they wrote that they had gone ahead on the road, they stopped at Tom Harris's plantation. Here we bought feed for our horses, we pitched a short a tent, short, and the people were very welcoming, uh, they, people, you know, strangers could stay there. Well, that kind of set things off. Um, again, in the archives of the Historical Society, John Whalen wrote to John Roller, who at that time, of course, owned the stone house, and Whalen wanted to know, tell me about the house. When was the house built? And so Ms. Uh, General Roller, at that time, was saying, it's always been known since I was a kid that it was built, you know, this, it's the oldest home here in Harrisonburg, but I never traced the title back. He said, I never traced the title back. Well, John Whalen ran with that. <laughs> and he decided, I guess, that it wasn't something that um, he needed to check out any further. And um, in his books from that point on, they all talk about Thomas Harrison House being built in 1750. OK, and of course, the house associated. So where was he living? If you all walk along the North End Greenway, you're on Thomas Harrison's homestead land. Thomas Harrison was not here. He was up there. Um, so if you actually take a good look at um, the tracts and the parcels of land that he owned, he was not living here in down, what is now downtown Harrisonburg. He was living north of town. He was living out toward what is now Eastern Mennonite University. Um, he was on the creek. But you can see that uh, there is the reference to the middle road, which of course is Kratzer Road, comes in off of 42, picks up with Route 11, ultimately Liberty Street picks up and goes on. Um, and the Harrison family actually had written about this. The Harrison family was very keen on making it known that it's very likely the homestead was somewhere else, but they were not listened to. Um, but it's known as the Harmon Pasture. So if you go up past the co-op, there's the um, fuel, the Southern States co-op that's up there off of Liberty Street. Um, there is a field that now the cattle are gone. We were chased by a big bull at one time, uh, but Black's Run runs through there. It's one of the places in Harrisonburg where you can still see lovely Black's Run. There it is. And there are archeological remains that are absolutely old. There is no question about it. There is a house up there. Now, is that enough? No, that's not enough. Um, we have to take a look at other things. So for example, the will, remember what the um, Moravians said? They talked about Tom Harris's plantation. 1807, w Reuben Harrison, I give and bequeath of the same manner as the above old plantation. And we know that that was the tract he was talking about. We have traced it, and we know that was the tract that he was talking about. The Moravians called it the Old Plantation. Reuben called it the Old Plantation. This is Reuben's house. It was not the Old Plantation. <laughs> Reuben's house on the corner of Liberty and Elizabeth Streets, uh, and as we say, not the Old Plantation. So 
pretty interesting to be able to put that together. So this is where we come back to James Hall. This is where we come back to the larger question of what this house means and how it is tied into uh, the story here. The stone house, I believe, is tied to transportation history. And I'll tell you why I think that is true. Uh, Maria Carr talks about the fact that th she says, I'll begin at the first building on the south end of the west side of Main Street, or it was known then the Stanton Road. And she's talking about that lot right over there where the church is today. Um, there was a large stable or barn belonging to Mr. Bockett, who ran a line of stages from Winchester to Stanton, first weekly, twice a week, then three times a week. Um, and according to Waddell, the history of Augusta County, it took three days to get from Winchester to Stanton in the stage, and there had to be accommodations for overnight. And so there were accommodations in Woodstock, and there were accommodations in Harrisonburg. And Mr. Bockett was right there, okay? Um, so I believe that the stone house formerly known, the house formerly known as the Thomas Harrison House, was an inn, and I think that the lot housed stables until the Hall family moved in, but they only lived there a short time, and it may have gone back to being an inn. The incredible amount of animal bone, the meat that was being processed, is a direct indication of cooking for large numbers of people who are not members of the same household, so to speak. And so if you can imagine a whole series of buildings like that. Now, we can put that into even greater context and we bring back in the story of the enslaved people who were living in this household because at this time, not only do you have the Valley Pike and the stagecoach going through, but you also have the Warm Springs Turnpike coming in and it ends in the front yard of the Hardesty Higgins house, okay? And so if you imagine big stables and barn there, in over here, stables over here, and then stables in the front yard of the Hardesty Higgins house owned by Jeremiah Kyle. Kyle was a businessman in Harrisonburg. He was very well positioned in society. He was also an enslaver. And one of the things that we learned when we were doing the archeology span at the Hardesty Higgins house is that there actually were older structures on that property before the brick house was built. There were log cabins, and in the doorway going into this cabin, we found these objects. And these, this is a cache of uh, West African, re reflects West African ritual belief. We know that Jeremiah Kyle had young men who were living there who were looking after horses, who, who were enslaved, and whose job it was to look after horses. And so I am thinking that perhaps Hall was in on that business as well, and that the young men who were enslaved and living in his household were part of this whole business that was going on. Okay, so again, transportation history, but the cowrie shell, the white hand, the porcelain doll hand, the two crystals, these are objects that are often found together. This is the only grouping like this that has been found west of the Blue Ridge, but these are commonly found at places like Mount Vernon, Monticello, Montpelier. Uh, associated with slave housing or the housing of enslaved people. And it was right over there, right across the street is where we found this. So the next thing that we've got to do is look at the history of these families some more, but we've got to really try to hone in. We really want to learn more about the African Americans who were living in these houses and not just this, not just the stone house, but all around this area. Um, we do have ground penetrating radar now, and so instead of trying to chunk our way through asphalt out back, we're hoping that that will help us see something that might be there. Uh, and we're going to hopefully at some point do some more archeology span because we have more questions than answers. Now, the last thing I wanna mention is this whole question of what do you do with a story that has been taken apart? Um, what do, does it make a difference that that house was not built by Thomas Harrison? And to whom does it make a difference? The Harrison family is important. There's no question they were very important to establishing the town. They were very important to Harrisonburg becoming what it was before the Civil War. Um, but I think it's very, it, it's important for us to remember that the story that has been associated with this house 
is actually a more recent story. It's a story that is a little over 100 years old. It doesn't go back to the beginning of that house. And so why was it important to have a place that you could point to that said, this is where the founder of Harrisonburg lived? It's an anchor. It's an anchor of our local history, but at the same time, it constrains you. And I kept thinking about this. When that house is preserved, when that house is protected, what are you going to do? You tell the story of Thomas Harrison, people come in and look at it a couple of times, and then what do you do? What, what's next? What's next? Well, now we know what's next. Now we know that there are all of these questions that are tied to the early history of Harrisonburg that are tied to bigger regional questions that we have not been able to ask because we were so constrained by that thought that that house was built by Thomas Harrison. And now that we can say it was not built by him, it just opens a lot of doors. And I think it's pretty exciting. I'm really uh, energized by it. Um, and again, uh, not to take anything away from Thomas Harrison, we've got to go dig up his house now. That's the next thing. But um, I just feel very strongly that this has presented us with a very important opportunity. And I thank you all for being here tonight to hear the story. Oh, and I do have, whoops, I have thank yous. <laughs> thank you. All right. Are there questions? Yeah, uh, Fort Harrison. Yes. What's the story of Well, that? there you go. So Daniel was Thomas's brother, right? Uh, Daniel kind of worked his way up through the military ranks more than Thomas did. Um, and there have been a number of archaeology projects out at Fort Harrison. And um, it's, a, another, it's a similar thing where there has always been this mythology around, it, you know, calling it Fort Harrison, even though there has never been found a fortification around that building. There's never been found a tunnel to the spring which was always part of the story. Um, and the artifacts are later. And so I would suspect that uh, we are looking at a family that was living in a log cabin, and later when they came into money, when they really were established, they put the money into the house. Mm -hmm. And that's when they built it. But I think that it's probably, it's highly likely that people were living on that tract for 30 years before that stone house was built. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that there was a tunnel between the old kitchen we dug, we've looked. <laughs> we have looked for that tunnel. I cannot tell you how many times people have been out looking for that tunnel. Oh, yeah. We've got the radar now, though. That's right. We've got the ground penetrating radar. Did um, you know that? No, that we, we just got that. Oh. Um, <laughs> but the, again, the, another really interesting study. You know, it's, it's, to me, it's much more interesting to embrace the complexity of these stories as opposed to just saying, well, there's Fort Harrison. Um, yeah, there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Did they keep in the basement? Yes. When they built that wall? Yes. Was it to keep the springs cleaner away from the slaughter and the cooking? Could have been. Um, and there's no question that was, uh, sorry? Can you repeat it a little? Oh, yes. The question was, with the spring, was, there a, was the wall built? between the hearth and the spring in order to keep the water clean and away from all of the work that was be probably the ash yeah, and the blood and everything else. Pre chances are pretty good because remember they were getting their drinking water out of that spring directly. So, um, but just the idea that you would separate out areas, you would separate out work areas is, is a very common thing as well. But yeah, no doubt they needed to protect that water source for sure. Yeah, good question. I have a couple of questions. We're going to see if I can uh, make sure that everybody can hear. Are we ready? So we have a question about the Ewing family house on Mount Clinton Pike, a few miles west, has a similar story. Was supposedly originally built around 1740 to 1780. Can you comment on that? I cannot, <laughs> but I would love to see it. Love to go to go visit. And you know, this is. Uh, I don't want to use the word squatter, but um, 
I do think we have to recognize that when folks first started showing up, when Europeans first started showing up in the valley, many of them came here without owning any land. They, ca they came here and sort of set up shop. And there were sometimes people here before them who got them to come, but a lot of times they were here for several years before any of their land was recorded. Uh, and so, again, another reason why you would see these houses that are built that are not as substantial. So w another person asks if the stone house is still the oldest structure still standing in Harrisonburg. We don't know. This is a good question. This is a great question. And I say we don't know because we don't know what kinds of log houses are still hiding underneath some of these houses that are still standing. Um, for example, when the jail was built on Liberty Street, um, they took down a two-story chestnut log cabin that nobody claimed to know was there, right? Because it was hiding underneath clapboard. Um, and so it would not surprise me if there were actually some older, rem uh, parts of older houses here. Yeah, it would be an interesting thing to try to understand, but nobody has really had the opportunity to look. And there's another question wondering if the owners of the Harmon Pasture are willing to allow exploration on the property, so. Well, as long as the bull is out of the field, I would be <laughs> glad to work, yeah. No, he chased my students and I into Black's Run. I've, ne <laughs> I've never had a bull paw at the ground and snort at me before, and I've been in the field for many years. But uh, no, it would, I think that would be a wonderful thing to do. And um, we, we've wandered through the area and there, there's no question that there are some old sites there. Yeah. We also have a question about evidence of Native Americans, and I'm not sure if they're talking about in the cellar. Which lot? I yeah. Don't know. Well, I will tell you that we do have a few stone flakes from from uh, sharpening stone tools that in our excavation, and there are people who have reported finding stone tools, finding spear points in that basement before next to the spring. We have not seen those, but um, that does not, would not surprise me in the least because springs like that are, were always drawing, uh, always drew native people in and you would expect to see artifacts there. But we did find a few flakes of chert that had been napped, that had been broken purposefully for sharpening stone tools. Do we have any more questions from either audience? I guess it's a general question. And aside from, you know, just uh, kind of discovering the, the bombshell, aside from just kind of discovering the bombshell that, uh, you know, this was not, in fact, Thomas Harrison's uh, house, um, were there any other major discoveries or something that just really shocked you or surprised the team, um, kind of peeling back the layers? I think what shocked us was how quickly the two feet of water rose after four inches of rain <laughs> um, after we had finished excavating. That was really a shocker. Um, I think that um, one of the things that surprised us didn't happen during the excavation, but it was after when we were processing the artifacts, we found a number of fragments of dolls, porcelain dolls, uh, in the assemblage. We found a lot of buttons. We found, as we mentioned, as I mentioned, tools that look like seamst a seamstress was at work there. And so just the question of whether or not there was that kind of work happening uh, in the basement and who was doing that work, more than likely an enslaved person, a uh, woman who was in that, in that place. Um, but the idea that there were these, I think we had about six fragments of different porcelain dolls. So were there children? Yeah, yeah. What are the considerations for excavating the, the spring? What, what are the problems? You know? I would just want to have an engineer to look at, look at it first because frankly the stone is, it's dry stack stone. Um, it, the, some mortar put in at different points in time, but it is so loose in places that I would feel pretty uncomfortable just starting to take it apart. Yeah, yes. What I meant is that it was, and thank you for asking, that's a good question that you asked. We need that clarification. What I meant is that it is more in the Germanic style that houses are built over top of springs here in the valley. So that's when I say a German spring, that's, that's what I mean. 
English hearth and a German spring. Yeah. Referring to the shards that could have been Native American, um, can you say more about why the shards indicate slaves versus workers? Or would any cooks at the roadhouse have been slaves at that time? So maybe not the Native American shards, but just anybody oh, cooking. Oh, oh, I see what they're, yeah, I see what they're asking. Well, certainly, um, the assumption that I'm making is based on the evidence of the very, very different kinds of um, ceramics that are found in nothing matching nothing matching and that is a typical pattern for an enslaved person's house yeah and plus the fact that we have the census records that now tell us that there were enslaved people living in that household i'm going to apologize to the webinar questioner <laughs> that i got i got confused there um and last question that i see is anyone doing historiography of john wayland <laughs> looking at how John Wayland wrote history, instead of just reading his history, looking at his methods. Um, I cannot, I know that there are a um, lot of historians who um, have run into these kinds of problems that I ran into with John Wayland, um, recognizing, of course, that he did a tremendous amount of work, but also recognizing that. I don't want to say he cut corners, but he was definitely not as careful as he should have been. And I think that's coming out more and more. Yeah, yeah. But as was the case for many people who were writing history in his day and time, you know, he was trained, but at the same time, he had a pretty clear idea of how he wanted Valley history to look. And it shows up again and again in his books. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Well, I guess that's the end of our questions, and I just want to say thank you so much, Carol. Thank you for everyone joining in. Let's give Carol a big round of applause. At this point, I will wrap up the webinar with just a couple of notes. Um, if you appreciated the program, I invite you to like, follow, share the Rocktown History Facebook and Instagram accounts, and certainly sign up for our emails so that you will have the newest news. If you visit the rocktownhistory.org website, you can sign up there for the email list, but you can also keep an eye out for our um, upcoming calendar under the News and Events tab. And certainly, donations are always appreciated, so we can have more of these wonderful programs. If you're interested in volunteering, get in touch with us. Um, but for now, I'll just say stay curious and support your local history. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.